Uh, there's another lab, which is a kinetics lab. And uh, this one, they actually have a, a special way of doing it. So the kit does have uh, this assembly. So as uh, Scott uh, is setting it up, this is to look at the effect of acid concentration on the rate of decomposition acid catalyzed or rate of reaction with acid. Um, the premise for this lab in the investigations is the weathering of marble, but it could also be uh, applied to environmental science, acid rain, uh, limestone, and, and you know all of the kinds of things that are happening. Actually, I thought that the most interesting current application that I read, how many of you read about the sinkhole in Florida? And it was a great tragedy, and a terrible tragedy, somebody was killed. It turns out that that bedrock is limestone based and that it has been uh, weathered, eaten away, whatever, by acidic groundwater. And so what happens is basically the acidic groundwater rises up, eats away that calcium, calcium carbonate bedrock, and you essentially uh, create empty space there and then that eventually sits. So, you know, you can talk about whether in marble statues and, and all sorts of things. So we have pre-measured about uh, 0.65 grams. So we've taken one piece of marble <coughs> here, okay? But they're roughly equal. One of the downsides of this, and it's part of the experimental design, and I keep harping on that, because we, we can't go through it all here, but surface area is a variable that's not controlled if you use a marble chip because those marble chips are not identical. One may have a greater surface area, and surface area is a variable that affects the kinetics of a heterogeneous reaction. So we're supposed to be looking at the effect of concentration, and all of this, all of this is part of what the students need to think about. So you can see, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions about inquiry labs. Anybody want to, you know, if you haven't ever done any, or if you just have heard your colleagues talking, what are some of the things that teachers say about inquiry labs? Either about their own ability to do them or students' ability. What are some of them? I don't have time. Absolutely. What else? What if they get the wrong answer? What if they get the wrong answer? Which the answer is that's okay. It's not about getting the right answer. Those are all misconceptions. Okay. If I don't have time, they'll get the wrong answer. There are two unstructured students won't know what to do. Anything else? Safety. Safety is course. And I have to tell you that that's why the College Board has made the AP Chemistry Labs guided inquiry and not open inquiry. They are limited in terms of the regions that they're using. Okay, so we've hit on a lot of them. Limiting reagents, that how can you plan for what they need? How do I give them what they need, right? And that, that relates to the, anything else? What's another one? My kids don't care enough. My kids don't care enough. You know, I think we sell our kids short. I think if we make these things interesting to them, they will care. But these are all good things. Has anybody heard, um, you know, guided inquiry labs, they're too easy? Have you heard that? Does any of this look like it would be too easy? So in terms of content, in terms of getting the students to really think about what they're doing, these labs are going to do that. And so from that point of view, I'm, I'm very, very pleased with the, the emphasis in the new College Board uh, because they really have to think about it. That challenge about I don't have enough time, the students won't know what to do, the students are going to get the wrong answers, that's where we're trying to provide I talked about authentic error analysis, authentic guidance. You know, get them to think of in it the right way. You don't have to give them the answer, but you have to get them to think about things in the scientific way, right? Okay, so this lab involves HCl and calcium carbonate, and we have a syringe here. It is a large syringe, because otherwise it will not work. There's a stop pack here, we will keep that open. It's in a rubber stopper. We've got about 0.65 grams. No, I just wanted 10. Can we can do that. Here, hold on. John, claim the flash is from the camera. What's that? The flash is from the camera. He was. 
I'm just grateful that Scott is doing all the work here. This is Pyrex. Okay. It is. <laughs> okay. So we, we want about 10 milliliters. And we, we can use the official guidance for workshops, which is close enough for government work. Okay, so as soon as he pours that in, we're going to stop with that. Okay, we're kind of going to do this, because you've got to kind of release a little bit of friction. And if that's in there, and now, is this the one molar or the three molar? This is one molar. Okay, this is going to be rather slow, so we're going to let that go. And we'll, let's go ahead and do the three molar. Ten milliliters. Ten milliliters, yes. And we'll, we'll just kind of see if it's, so that starts to. It is beginning to generate just a little bit of gas. Okay, we've got three molar here, and I've got this way. Hold on, give me one sec. Okay. It's open. Obviously, I want to be sure that it's open. Okay, and you can see that that one is beginning to generate some gas at a faster rate. So this is uh, kinetics, and there's actually two parallel techniques that they can do. They can do mass loss, and they can measure the volume of gas. Even before you start, um, you, may, you will certainly know, and many of your students might know as well, that you know if you're measuring CO2 gas, we all know that CO2 gas is soluble in water. So there's already kind of a foundation of error here which is how much gas is soluble, but as long as you compare things uh, neck and neck, so to speak, you'll be able to see that. Um, I was really, really very pleasantly surprised at the results that we got for this. I am going to show you this graph. Um, this is actually, and I committed a cardinal sin, I didn't label uh, the concentrations for these dots, but we used three different concentrations, four molar, two molar and one molar. And remember, here's something where you need to talk about the method of initial rates, um, because all of these level off. We've actually charted here the percent completion. And you can see that all of them kind of go to 80%, and I think that's the amount that is trapped in the water, so you never get more than 80% of the volume of CO2 that you would calculate. And you have to do those Gauss laws to calculate what would be the maximum volume that I could achieve based on the amount of calcium carbonate that's in there and so on. But you can certainly see this. These went, uh, you don't know, have to go for 15 or 20 minutes. We went, I think, for 20 minutes on all of them. By the method of initial rates, you would actually only look at about the first let's say 20% of completion. And what's really, really neat is that if you draw the straight lines for, let's say, the first 20 or 30% of that reaction, you get exactly uh, the ratio of two molar being twice as fast as one molar and the four molar being twice as fast as the Two molar. It's it's exact. It's perfect data. It, this is real data, and it's not perfect because you can see the things that are you know involved here. You only get to eighty percent, and again, that's because some of the CO two does dissolve. And what's nice about this is you can do the uh, let's just see. That's beginning to generate any at all. This one is beginning to generate it. Here we've got three molar and one molar. Usually you would ask them to, to at least kind of stir it as well. So those are uh, the labs that we have. And uh, we are very, very excited about the new advanced inquiry laboratory kits that we're writing. But we're also most excited about partnering with you and giving you options for success in AP chemistry. And again, don't throw out your traditional labs. If you love them and they work for you, we will have on our website free handouts for every single traditional lab about adapting it for inquiry. And I think you'll find that when you read these, there's a lot of really good information here. We are very excited. We've had a huge response to the advanced inquiry lab kits. This tells me the teachers are really eager for this. So that's 
been very exciting to us. We did, we gave you one example in your packets. There's another example on our website. All of these can be ordered now. We have made them available as a bundle. Uh, and so you can, we've given you a spotlight which describes every, of the, every one of the new advanced inquiry lab kits, uh, the materials that are in there, and so on. There's more information about each one on our website as well. I did want to say a couple of things. Um, I get a lot of very common questions. The most common question that I get is, what else do I need to do all of these labs? And we will put all of that information on our website as soon as we have finalized everything. This is active development. Uh, we are truly trying to finish everything so that we can make it all available to you. Uh, and again, uh, so we'll put all of that information on our website. The other common question that we get is, what kind of major equipment do I need? Okay? And uh, I can tell you that there are three very important things you need. Three, three of the 16 new College Board labs are spectrophotometric labs. That tells me that the College Board has placed a great emphasis on Beer's Law, knowing how to do a calibration curve, knowing how to use a calibration curve. They use it for a concentration analysis, they use it for the crystal violet fading, and they use it for another uh, composition of a mixture lab, the percent copper and grass. So if you don't have spectrophotometers, please give us a call so that we can uh, do a quote for you to get the spectrophotometers or colorimeters that you need, because you will need uh, spectrophotometers. I don't think it's an option not to do a spectrophotometer lab, because I think there will be a question on the exam. They've done three out of the 16. 20% of the labs are spectrophotometric. Um, the other thing that's big is uh, there's a lot of uh, acid-based labs, and you really need some pH meters. Um, in order to do, they, they do titration curves in the acid-based titrations, and they really want them to understand the differences in terms of strong acid, strong base, strong, uh, weak acid, strong base, strong base, weak acid, and, and you know the fourth one, there's four of them, right? Weak acid, weak base, obviously. So if you don't have pH meters, again, talk to us and we can uh, give you some advice and recommendations on what we think is best we do have the little Flynn pH meters, and we calibrate those, and they give great results. So uh, if you're interested in those, we can describe those to you more fully. And finally, there are a few of the labs that are gravimetric type analysis labs, and so uh, an analytical balance that goes to at least three significant, three decimal places. So I actually recommend that the best electronic balance you can get is a milligram balance, not a 0.1 milligram balance. So if you don't have one of those, we do have a special going on uh, to uh, connect that uh, milligram balance. I want to acknowledge um, Scott, who is here, who has been involved in testing all of these. Also, the two chemists who are, uh, two other chemists who are not, one of whom is not here. Joan Berry is the newest chemist on our staff. She and Scott did a, a workshop this morning to a full house, so they had a great crowd. Joan Berry has been involved in this. Mike Frazier is uh, staying be behind. He's tending the home fires. He is answering all the calls from teachers all alone this week. So if you want to give him a call and just say, hey, Mike, we really love you. We think you're terrific. Uh, go ahead and do that. I want to thank all of you, but I want to thank all of the staff in tech services for testing, retesting, retesting again, and optimizing so we can do good work.